Welcome in, listener. You're listening to a segment from the Slump Buster podcast with Juju and Dre. Find the full episode on Spotify, iTunes, the Google Play Store, or our YouTube channel. Enjoy. All right, so our next subject, I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but kind of like within the Slump Buster with Juju and Dre, we're doing a little bit of a get your popcorn in a way. So we're going to be talking about the new Chuck and Tito documentary that was put out there by ESPN's 30 for 30 series. It's a very informative documentary in itself. I enjoyed watching it a lot. As I mentioned, I'm a casual viewer. So mm-hmm. like a lot of the bigger names like a Chuck Liddell or a Tito Ortiz, when I was kind of like going through high school, middle school, these names just really stood out to me. These were one, one of the few names I really was able to cling on to. So to kind of learn the backstory and learn how these fighters' legacies kind of developed over time, and especially watch the early days of the UFC where it was just Literally. So it, the big contention with UFC in the past was it was basically like human cockfighting. And I could definitely understand that sentiment from our con- congressmen and women when they came to this because, God bless, these guys were just killing each other in there. They were throwing NFL punts. They were wrestling up and down weight classes. No one gave a shit. They were just all over the place. What do you think of the documentary, man? Yeah, so I thought, to me, it's one of my favorite documentary, well, sports documentaries, I should say, and that, like, it was cool to see the history of the UFC and how it sort of first got started, and then you start to see where a lot of these early sort of Hall of Fame, you know, UFC fighters sort of came in and what the different styles were and how different the sport really was back then, because it was, in my opinion, a completely different sport back then from what it is now, like, oh, yeah. you had dudes with one boxing glove right you could wear shoes into the <laughs> ring or well yeah like the octagon back then and, and you could, all this yeah hits to the back of the head right like you could axe kick them in the face there's all kinds of crazy stuff punching you could literally punch their nuts if you wanted to back then you know it's um, funny i'm just like thinking like one of my favorite youtube series is like seeing um i don't remember who it, who does this one but some notable ufc fighters will actually do like wwe moves on each other just for shits and giggles mm-hmm. and it kind of reminded me of this whenever i was watching the early development of the ufc because you just see like people breaking up the ri- most ridiculous moves on this it was it looks like a completely different sport, to be honest. Oh, yeah. No, it, it was a completely different sport. The thing that I also like, though, is you see how much of a genius Dana White and the Fertitta brothers really were, though, right? And taking it <laughs> from what it was, buying low, and then now getting it to the point where they could sell high. Like, I uh-huh. I have a lot of beefs with Dana White and the way that he treats the fighters and some of the, some of the stuff. Like, I don't... I do like the sport part of UFC and that I want to see the best guys fight. And I know that that doesn't always sell tickets, right? Especially when you have guys that are like really good grapplers and that's how they win. That doesn't always sell the most seats. So Dana won't make those fights. But at the same time, like Dana's a genius and you could see why he started Mm -hmm. to promote Tito Ortiz the way that he did. And then eventually Randy Couture and Chuck Liddell. Well, so you mentioned the business side of things. They threw out those numbers there. It was bought for $2 million, and then as of 2016, they flipped it into a $4 billion sell. That is, <laughs> talk about being pro-capitalism, pro-free market, that's a hell of a business purchase right there to take mm-hmm. this like ragtag group of fighters and turn them into one of the most prolific sports organizations known today. Amazing. One of the better business accomplishments I've ever seen. Now, as far as Dana White, Tito Ortiz has kind of spoken up about this documentary already, even before it like came out officially to us viewers. He was very vocal in saying Dana was out there changing stuff to make himself look better. And after watching it like this time, I, I do kind of understand what he meant because Dana was so quick to be like, oh, Tito's an idiot, he doesn't know nothing. And mm-hmm. Yeah, I felt Dana, def- as much as Dana tried to make himself look more, more likable, in this documentary, the UFC tried to make Dana look as the good guy. I kind of hated Dana a little bit more after watching this, if I'm going to be honest. Yeah, no, I agree. And so I definitely respect Dana White as like, he really is the, the genius behind, hey, how can I bring what the UFC was to making it this modern day sport? But you could definitely tell that, that he's sort of a sleazeball, right? Like he 100% will throw a fighter under the bus to save his own skin. He will try to screw people out of money, right? Like, But that's part of, I think, also what made him so successful and allowed him to take the UFC to where it is today. doesn't mean 
he's a good guy. Doesn't mean I like him anymore. But yeah, I agree. <laughs> there's there's definitely stuff to to hate about Dana White. I I gotta say, I was pretty shook whenever I saw Dana White with hair. <laughs> I, yeah, I was too. I saw and I was like, is that really Dana White? Like he was skinny, he had hair. Him and Joe Rogan just talking to each other with hair. It was just like a sight to behold. Clearly not a lot of people are using hymns or, you know, touch of grain or whatever it takes to get some up there, you know. But <laughs> I got to say, so like some other initial thoughts. I found that Tito's quote, like when he first got introduced to wrestling, was so hilarious because it reminded me of my first time stepping into a wrestling room, right? Backstory. So back in the day, obviously, I started off in junior wrestling myself, my little background here, right? And I did it because I wanted to play football. Football was going to be the sport I liked. It was the most entertaining thing to me, like growing up, everything back in the day, right? And my dad, like, said, listen, son, aunt, I mean, he knew to actually say this, but I'm just adding this as story. Listen, son, you're fat as shit, <laughs> honestly <laughs> you're not athletic at all we got to get you in shape before we could throw you out there to play football right so I jumped into junior wrestling my sixth grade year Jesus Christ that first practice oh my god like I think 10 minutes in so not even like past the warm-up I was already throwing my guts out into the trash bin yeah. I was just dying like dad look at my dad and like the parents corner like what did you do to me what did I do to you <laughs> like this is just mean cruel unfair I'll, I'll play baseball again. I don't care. Just dad, get me out of here. <laughs> but like compared to the, the Tito story. So like Tito was saying it from this perspective, like, yeah, you know, I was a big time WWE fan. I loved that shit growing up. And when they were introduced me to wrestling, I was thinking I was going to go out there, like swing some chairs around, jump off the top rope, kind of like your like wrestler you mentioned last week, you know? Yep. Yep. And I just related to that on a personal level because there, that was also in the back of my head. So like first impressions of a wrestling room are vastly different from when you're actually in that 130 degree room with 50 other guys running back and forth, back and forth and drilling for three hours a day. <laughs> yep. Yeah, no, the, and, and that's the thing is there's a lot of people that never actually do the sport of wrestling and they'll never have any idea what it's like, but it is so hard. It is so challenging, but it was funny hearing Tito go in like, oh, and you can actually like slam people. And it's like, yeah, <laughs> you can go in and throw them as hard as you want. Right. And, yeah. and it's pretty much legal here. So it was cool to hear. And it makes sense, too, why Tito was so dominant, like, coming into, like, the sport, because we talk about what that transition between when it stopped being, like, a sideshow, when it started becoming a legitimate sports organization. So wrestlers mm -hmm. like a Tito Ortiz or people with a dynamic wrestling background definitely could dominate a little bit more than, than they can nowadays when it, everything's kind of even out, the talent is kind of leveled out a little bit to where these guys have multiple fighting styles that they're properly trained in. Mm -hmm. But these wrestlers, these grapplers, like Hoist Gracie, all that, they were able to dominate in UFC's early going. And that's why Tito was able to elevate himself up the card so quickly, despite, and this was a big thing during the documentary, when his striking got called into the question by Dana White and other people that didn't necessarily have as much bias against Tito. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think you're exactly right. And that was the thing, right, is wrestling and grappling, right, whether it's jujitsu or whatever, Back then, that allowed you to dictate where the fight went. It still does today. And it was so new. There was nobody really doing ground fighting at all. So when you got taken down, it was just going to be a bloodbath. And I think that's what really helped promote Tito Ortiz is because, like, his fighting style, he loved to just get after it. But if he had to, he would take you down and, like, just beat your face in. And that's what people <laughs> love to see. And, like, back then, it was hard to get up, right, is if you got taken down. Now, nowadays there's different techniques, right? Like you can shrimp to, to get back to your guard, right? There's different ways you could push off and, and get back up to your feet, do different types of stand-ups. But yeah, it was, you're exactly right. But Tito Ortiz, I think the whole WWE thing that you mentioned earlier too, was huge and instrumental in promoting MMA, right? And the UFC, mm -hmm. but also in how guys promote themselves. Because I see a little bit of, of that Tito Ortiz in your Conor McGregor types nowadays, right? and your, your Ronda Rousey's and stuff like that, and that he sort of was the poster child for how do you bring this WWE crazy antic type stuff to fighting a professional fighting environment and get paid. Yeah, no, it was definitely one of the more instrumental things in elevating him up the card as well, besides his actual ability, his ability to talk on the mic and promote a fight 
mm-hmm. is something that was p- pivotal because you look at the pay-per-view buy numbers for him in that first fight with Chuck. If Tito Ortiz wasn't the person or the personality he was, it would have not drew half as many buys as it did. That's also saying because Chuck, again, he was one of the best fighters back in the day of the UFC's early going, but he didn't necessarily, he wasn't the best personality out there. He was kind of like as exciting as drywall, to be honest. So like to have that duality between him and Tito going back and forth kind of helped promote that fight in a proper, suitable way. Of course, That brings it back to what I was saying earlier. You have to strike when the iron's hot when it comes to these fights. Mm -hmm. Because every now and then you're going to get thrown a curveball the longer you wait on them. That curveball for this documentary, for this fight, was Randy Couture. And shout out to Randy. We hope you get well soon, man. We hear you had a heart attack this week. Uh, Wish you nothing but the best. You probably shouldn't try and finish a workout, though, if your heart is hurting. Just a little (laughs) FYI for future (laughs) reference there, man. But no, seriously, get well soon. But yeah, in this documentary, when he first beat Tito, when he first beat Chuck, it just threw a whole mess into anything the UFC was trying to lay out for their future plans. Yeah. No, and, and so what I want to say, going back to the Randy Couture thing, yes, of course, you know, get get well soon. Heart attacks are always scary to deal with. How much of a badass do you have to be, though, <laughs> to be like, hey, I, I, I might be having a heart attack, but I got to finish this workout. Like, that, that is, <laughs> is crazy. That's I mean, I thought I was having a heart attack my first wrestling practice, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, right? I, I think most, most young wrestlers, <laughs> by the time you get to your fifth sprint, you're like, oh, man, my heart, there it goes. But no, seriously, get get well, Randy. But you're exactly right. And and this is why the Masvidal and Diaz thing is so important, right? Is that if it doesn't happen this year, right? If it doesn't happen this time, and now they do have to suspend Nate Diaz because they found something in his urine, the fight might never happen again, right? And, and so mm-hmm. then it cools and nobody wants to see this fight. Or if the fight happens two years from now when these guys are 35 years old, which is old for fighting age or whatever yeah. it is. I don't know how old they are, right? I mean, we talked about it too with Ferguson and Khabib, you know, like those mm -hmm. two as well. You got to get this fight in now. Yeah. And you run that risk is the UFC. I don't think at that time they thought of it really being a risk to have a Chuck Liddell fight Randy Couture, but there's some guys that you're not expecting them to lose. And so you give them these other fights and then all of a sudden it totally derails something because they lost to somebody they weren't originally planned or supposed to lose to. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the other statistics from this movie and stuff. So UFC 66, the Chuck and Tito 2, it was the first million dollar buy in UFC history. So I found that fascinating. I think it just tells you how pivotal they were in making this sport an actual sport. Those Mm -hmm. guys will forever be entrenched in the UFC's legacy, no matter how many fighters come and go, because we see a lot of fluidity with the sport, a lot of the names that jump around and come off the card constantly. Now, I do think both these guys need to retire because their third fight that took place this past year under Golden Boy Productions did do so hot. Only 25,000 pay-per-view buys. Uh, Dana was one of the most outspoken on don't do this fight. And obviously, he just loves calling people idiots, man, because <laughs> like he's over there calling Oscar De La Hoya idiot too last year. And it's Hey, Oscar is a great boxer. He has a fantastic legacy, but you know, I guess I'll give Dana this win. I do kind of agree as a promoter, clearly. Anytime you're talking about 25,000 for two legends of sport, even two washed up legends of the sport, terrible fight promotion there. <laughs> terrible. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and then you have, we'll talk about this more, but Tito's still out there fighting himself. Chuck, I haven't talked about this much from the Chuck standpoint of things. It got sad there towards his final end of his career. He just had a glass jaw. There's no mm-hmm. doubt about it. It was gross watching the, his last few fights and him just get mauled each and every time. And to see that he lost this last fight against Tito by knockout just tells you, dude, your chin literally can't take it anymore. Yeah, no. And and that's the thing. And Dana had a good quote in that movie. And I forget his exact wording, but it was something along the lines of like, this is why it's so important to have people close to these MMA fighters give them their exact thoughts and being objective about the situations because a lot of these guys this is their bread and butter right like they don't really have another career that they could fall back on some do right some some are popular enough that they can become models in in magazines or whatever it is or commentators or you know they went to school and they're able to do something else but a lot of these guys like all they have is fighting 
But at a certain point, like they need somebody to tell them like, hey, you just don't have it anymore, right? Whether it's now your chin is made out of glass, like you were saying, or you just keep losing and keep getting beat up. One example that I could think of, you know, recently is BJ Penn. That's another dude that at one point he was fantastic. People loved watching him fight. He was a dude that would go up and fight anybody, didn't matter what the weight class was, and he'd fight out in pride. But he's gone on like a crazy losing streak. He's just been downhill. And he's one guy that you need to say like, hey, it's, it's time to hang it up. And going back to the Tito and Chuck thing, these guys, I think, didn't know when to hang it up. And on the other side, and this is what makes UFC so dominant, is these other promotions don't know when to call it quits with some of these guys. And they they take sort of the recycled UFC fighters, right? Your Rampage Mm -hmm. Jacksons, your Tito Ortiz's, your Chuck Liddell's. And they're like, yeah, these guys used to be big names. We're going to make them fight. But honestly, nobody wants to watch 45-year-olds beat up on each other and get knocked <laughs> out. Like, I'm sorry. I don't want to watch that, you know? No, no, it, it's completely true. Um, all right. Well, I, I think I've kind of like talk, talked about the documentary side of things. It was a very good documentary. I enjoyed watching it. It was very informative for someone yep. like me who just kind of like has watched from the sidelines for years. I will say, after watching this, Tank Abbott, you're, you're my new hero. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Again, one of the one of the bigger highlights from the early day UFCs was watching that guy. He was just a monster. Um, yep. So just since it was, it's kind of like a movie review we did here just now. So the system we're doing on Get Your Popcorn Right is basically for a five star, we're giving it a home run. Four mm-hmm. star, some warning track power. Right. Three stars, just a bloop single. Two stars, a foul ball. And a strikeout is just, you know, swing and a miss, one star, crappy movie. If you had to rate this, where would you put it? Uh, I would probably put it at a four star. The So warning track power? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, right there. So I, I do really enjoy MMA, right, and the UFC and stuff like that. I do think that the story could have been told just a little bit better. But that being said, it was entertaining. I do like seeing sort of the early days of the UFC, and it does give you some background into why the UFC is the way that it is. But like I said, I think the story development and the actual storylines could have been flushed out a little bit better. Yeah, it's got warning track power for me too. It was hit deep at the fence, just off the wall. ESPN always does great on these 30 for 30s. They're very informative. They always get the best people to come in. But if what Tito was saying is true about like Dana having his hands and how this final documentary was cut, it does kind of take away from it a little bit for me. Mm -hmm. I am interested. So the ESPN is actually going to be doing some more 30 for 30s on the UFC here in the coming month. If there's any more that kind of like catch our eye, we'll we'll probably jump on it. I I enjoy doing this little review here on it. And I think it's definitely productive for our fans that do love the fight community. I think it's a good thing for our show. And we definitely do appreciate all our fans who are MMA fans, UFC fans, etc. 